Hello and welcome, I'm Phil Moncaster and today I'm joined by Stuart Oaken, UK Managing Director of Security Consultancy Comsec and Stuart's had positions with Accenture and Microsoft as Chief Security Advisor before. Hi, hi Stuart. Hi Phil. Um, so you obviously have a, a lot of experience in the security business, um, what are kind of customers key challenges and concerns, what are they coming to you um, with? Our customers' key concerns and challenges are the same as they've, they've always been very uh, the, about protecting their applications, protecting their data, mm -hmm. and of course, because of PCI standards, protecting their client data as well. That, that's the most, most concern at the moment. Right. Now, a lot of people talk about you know, malware and, and the, the great risks from, from the outside, but I know a lot of it boils down to you know, how secure the code is. Um, you know, how important is that? Yeah, it, it's all about securing the code. I mean, we've all been, in the security professional world, we've been saying this for years. So you know, don't get me wrong, firewalls are important, mm. antivirus is important, et cetera. But if you have a code vulnerability, mm. um, a buffer overrun, a cross-site scripting, a filter evasion, whatever it might be, mm. um, the, the malware will just get straight through the firewalls as if they don't exist. Right. So it's absolutely critical to get the code secure from the get-go. Yeah, I mean after all this time it's still not being designed securely. What, what are the challenges on the, on the on the designer side I suppose, on the programmer side? Again, I, I don't think the challenges have really changed very much. Um, the, the challenges are, are, are business challenges. We've got to get the code out as quickly as possible yeah. to fill whatever business need that we have. So mm. the pressure is on the developers, the testers, the architects, the program managers to get software, get applications out as fast as possible. Mm. I think the difference is, um, if you go back 20 years ago, 20 years ago computing power was, was at a premium mm -hmm. and therefore you had to take a great deal of care in the quality uh, and, and the system engineering. Yeah. Plus of course you didn't have the web and the interconnectivity to worry about. Yeah. So, so the pressures are the same, but the conditions out there, the, the risk profile has greatly changed. Right. Now you guys are launching a new service. Can you tell us about CodeDefend and what, what that's aimed at? Absolutely. CodeDefend is, a, a, is an on-demand service mm -hmm. that allows the development community or the system integrators uh, or, or clients that are developing software and applications to pass their code, their source code, up to Comsec mm. to, uh, to be reviewed. And we use the next generation um, to set of tools to evaluate, we develop some custom rules, mm. and to evaluate the, the, the code to make sure that, uh, there's a, to see if there's any problems. And then we actually apply some human anal analytics, right. so we actually have a human uh, team there um, to review that, those particular code mm. as well, any of the uh, identified uh, problems to actually then report back to the client where problems exist. Right. The human side, I imagine, is quite important. It, it always seems to, to be anyway. Absolutely, yeah. The human side is, is, is vital. Most of the tools that exist there today are very powerful, very good tools, but mm. they can only pick up about 40% of the type of vulnerabilities that you might be seeing in um, OWASP top 10 or mm. the SANS top 25. They'll typically only pick up about 40% of that. And indeed, they quite often will have a lot of false positives. Mm -hmm. So a lot of uh, alerts will come back that developers will investigate and go, actually, that really isn't a problem. Mm. So the human element is incredibly important as part of the service. So the clients can, can send the code up that will be reviewed by, by the tool sets, yeah. but then we'll actually stream out the, the problems that don't really exist, right. and in fact identify problems like filter evasion, which mm. wouldn't be typically picked up yeah. by the tool. And I imagine as well, um, at one of the arguments about you know, co uh, making sure the code's secure from the get-go is that if you leave it sort of later in the development cycle, it gets more expensive to, to deal uh, with. Absolutely, it. yeah. I mean, we, we've, we've shown and we've demonstrated uh, by, by putting in security development life cycles mm. that you can actually get a hundredfold efficiency increase. Mm. I mean, huge savings. Um, so potentially up to around 50% savings on, on your entire development mm. um, cycle uh, when it comes to security recoding. And if you can imagine that towards the end of the life cycle, perhaps mm. maybe you produce your, your pen test, which we say that you should continue to do. We're not yeah. saying you know, miss out any steps. But you do the pen test, you find the vulnerability, you then have to go and perhaps re-architect mm. your system. Well, you know, that's, that's a huge overhead. In fact, we had one client uh, recently where actually they stopped and decided not to go to market right. with a product because it had too many vulnerabilities. Mm. I mean, that's a huge investment lost. Yeah. yeah, I know Microsoft's doing a lot around that as well as the next Microsoft uh, bod. Um, do you have any thoughts on, you know, the, the sort of how 
um, influential the security development life cycle and in, initiative has, has been on, on the industry? Or? I think that the security development life cycle uh, in the industry has been very influential mm. on those people that can really afford right. to, to, to invest in these areas. Mm. So of course all the big software houses, anybody that, that's, that's got a, a big uh, budget around development mm -hmm. and system integration, um, there really is no excuse and in fact you know it's been my experience working with them that they have actually started to move towards these SDLC and mm. and the SDLC would in, involves not only uh, training but also threat assessments right. and code reviews all the way through yeah. the, the life cycle however it can be more cost prohibitive for, for the sort of medium size or smaller mm. companies that are developing bespoke systems mm. and that's where um, companies are starting to bond services like CoDefend to actually be able to start to cut those costs down, but still to implement the security they need. Right. Is there a role for, for government in sort of forcing firms to, um, to look at code more securely, or is it, is it a sort of thing that really the market has to decide? Well, I'm, I'm kind of against massive regulation. Yeah. Um, uh, I think that, uh, that the market has to, has to sort itself out. Um, we've come a long way. Mm. We've come a long way. In the last uh, year or so now, um, people like OASP and SANS have started to mm -hmm. publish. You know, the, the industry has started to publish. These are the common vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. These are the common errors. Um, a few years ago, uh, whilst I was at Microsoft, for example, we started to encourage universities mm -hmm. to start to train and bring back software engineering back into, uh, into the software coding. And I think we, we need to encourage that, that mm. more before we start to say to the government, you need to regulate. I mean, it'd be very difficult for them to, to regulate. More importantly, uh, very difficult for them to police. Yeah. Uh, and, and any warranty that would be associated with that would be put back into the cost back to the end user right. anyway. Sure. Broadening it out a bit, you know, the government and security, there's, a, there's been a lot in the news and Gordon Brown's plan, plans for the security czars and, and, and that sort of thing. Is that a step in the right direction? Is it a missed opportunity? I think it's a bit of both, right. uh, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I think it is a step in the right direction. There is finally a, mm. a, a strategy paper, um, you know, sort of nine years after the web really is, yeah. has, sort of, uh, has sort of taken off. Um, so yeah, that is a step in the right direction. Um, I think it is a missed opportunity though, in the sense of the, the government has focused very much of, upon what it needs to do behind the scenes to protect the citizens and business, mm. rather than look to see what it can do to help mm. citizen business. So um, I put in my blog recently that uh, if you look at the FAQ at the back of the, uh, the, 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 the advisory paper, mm. the strategy paper, it basically says if you're a business or a citizen, if you've got a problem, here are the sort of 10 agencies you need to go to. Well, I think there was a missed opportunity there where, where we could have actually said, you know, the government would like to focus a strategy on, 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 on a single point or yeah. an overall governance whereby you know, business or citizen can turn to, to, to take advice rather than the sort of 10 different directions they need to go in. And as we were discussing before we yeah. went on air about the sort of international involvement, sure. you know, where, that could, where, where those international uh, points could be, uh, mm. could be put in place. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, you've got to start somewhere. So uh, I think that's good that, they, that there is a strategy paper mm. and we're starting on that journey. Still some way to go then. Still some way to go. Thanks for joining me, Stuart. Thanks, Phil. Thanks for watching. See you next time.